Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan M.S. Pitts. This is Ukraine War news update, third part thereof for the 17th of April 2024. We're going to start this geopolitical smorgasbord with what's going on in Georgia. So as I reported yesterday, there were big demonstrations, peaceful demonstrations, at least that's how they started and that's how they were being um, carried out by the protesters themselves until special forces got involved but uh yeah things yesterday were heating up in tbilisi as georgians seemed ready to oust putin's proxy from government um right what's going on with well, the, the the georgian dream government that has a majority in parliament there was trying to pass and has now successfully passed the this foreign agents law which sounds prima facie like it's a good idea for democracy you know we don't want foreign influence in our elections but it actually isn't that it's really just smoke and mirrors for trying to have an iron grip on your democracy and uh, be able to control the democratic uh, procedures in the country. And it's exactly what Russia have done. It's pretty much a carbon copy of the law Russia have put in place and Hungary, I believe, as well. Uh, so Georgia Dream, in line with those two places, are looking like going down that same pro-Russian route uh, with uh, their, they are basically a proxy government, really, a puppet government for the Russians, or at least they become that very much. Um, and uh, yeah, so as a result, as they were debating this in Parliament, there were huge protests outside with Georgian flags, pro EU flags and whatnot. It's quite obvious that a lot of the population want the country to go in a Western direction, but the government, uh, under the influence of Russia, wants to take the country towards Russia. Uh, and here we are. Uh, special forces then started arriving last night. You had water cannons arriving. You had tear gas, I believe, being used uh, uh, on people outside the parliament building there. There's lots of footage uh, coming out now. You can see, you know, riot police all over the shop. Huge. I was trying to get that large. No, I can't. It's not. Oh, there we go. Always uh, very unnerving when you see so many people in black ski masks and uh, supposedly, you know, trying to uphold the laws of the land as they go around um, anonymously beating the crap out of civilians. Uh, and, and that's pretty much what you get. So Georgians risking their lives attempting to get the Russians out of their government uh, at this hour in Tbilisi, says Jane Kiev last night. Meanwhile, 7,000 miles away in D.C., Putin's Republican Party is totally frozen. The U.S. government, ouch. Um, so that's what his views are, but certainly not looking good there. And there's plenty of footage coming out of the authorities using very heavy-handed uh, tactics. Uh, right now, the Russian public government in Georgia has brought all the culture of Russia to crack skulls on the streets of Tbilisi. Uh, and again, that I, this is my favourite picture. Main photo from yesterday's rally against the draw, draft law on foreign agents in front of Parliament in Georgia says Nexta, and you've got just two people there standing uh, you know, courageously looking at all these people in ski masks and riot gear. Uh, one has a Georgian flag, the other has an EU flag, uh, and it's just that's it. You know, the the public standing up against uh, the mass of government thugs. Um, yeah. Anyway, today, despite massive public opposition and unrest, Georgian Parliament has just approved a law written in the Kremlin, a law that would be used to jail critics of the Russian puppet regime. Georgia is now highly likely to explode in wider violent protests. But unlike in 2014 Ukraine, this time no Russian troops are coming, as they're all quite busy at the moment. So it's an interesting parallel there to Euromaidan protests in 2014. And I was wondering about this last night. Where does this go? Do they have enough... Um, momentum and enough desire that that was seen in the 2014 Euromaidan pre, um, protests I advise you all go and watch Winter on Fire on well I think it's free on YouTube now so you can watch it whether you have Netflix or not but it's a Netflix documentary it is one of the greatest documentaries I've ever seen Winter on Fire and if you want to get a handle on who who really was involved in Euromaidan in the protest there and how it was a groundswell 
thing nothing to do with nato encroachment these were students and old people and young people and and all sorts just just living together uh, for so long at that at that square that i've been to myself I overlooked uh, i've been in a hotel staying in a hotel that was used as a kind of ad hoc hospital for a part of it um just is, is incredible uh, a testament to to the power of uh, those who who love freedom and are fighting for freedom through peaceful protests, fighting through for peace, right? Uh, do, does Georgia have the ability, do Georgians have the ability, the momentum to do that? How will it manifest now? You know, what? How does this problem for, for the Georgia Dream Party evolve? Do, do they shut it down? Have they successfully shut it down using uh, heavy-handed tactics? The... Georgian uh, Georgia Dream Party has that majority in Parliament, so they can pass that easily. As Nexus says here, they they passed approved the draft law on foreign agents at the first reading. Uh, all eighty three MPs present in the hall voted in favour of it. Protesters shouted Russians in response to the Parliament's decision. I have a feeling Georgia Dream have a majority of eighty three. Uh, I, I does that mean that? Not a majority of 83. They have 83 MPs and that is a majority. Does that mean all of the Georgia Dream MPs voted for it? Or were they the only MPs present in the hall? Uh, language, obviously, important for understanding there. But yeah, the, uh, is gonna be, this is going to be one to watch over the, net, over the coming weeks, definitely. Now, at the same time, uh, there has been a removal of Russian peacekeepers from Azerbaijan in the Karabakh region, three and a half years after the start of their mission in the region. And they were kind of um, mainly on the side of the Armenians initially, I think, keeping peace between the two uh, fractious nations. And they are now pulling out. And personally, I think that's just about getting personnel and equipment back to the front line in Ukraine where they're needed more than in Azerbaijan. It's kind of, yeah, you guys can work it out yourselves now. Uh, and I think, you know, Azerbaijan are taking back control over that area. Uh, Armenia are getting assistance from France and are looking westwards increasingly. And Russia is getting out of Dodge. So my up and down feeling about the whole of this conflict and about the geopolitical, this 4D geopolitical chess in general is, uh, you know, oh, that's good or oh, it's bad, good, bad, good, bad. And on the one hand, I think, oh, the Ukraine is doing really well on the front line. By, and by that, I mean, yeah, they're ceding territory, but they are attriting the Russian forces incredibly. And then you have strikes like last night. And then you get the Russians absolutely hammering the Ukrainian uh, an energy system and I get all down again and they go oh Georgia's looking good but then is that crushed oh then I'm down then you're thinking these troops are being pulled back from Azerbaijan that's a good sign that the Russians have been attrited but then what does that mean is going to happen in Azerbaijan Armenia Armenia are looking away from Russia towards uh, the west and so it's so all this up and down and it's just like mm, I'm not, it's really difficult to get a sense of uh, an overall sense of where we're at, you know, and a percentage of hopeful to, uh, you know, or, or you know, depressed to hopeful. Um, I, I just don't know where we are because then I look around Europe and that's where we're going to go to now. And you think, right, Slovakia, Robert Fitzo, populist prime minister, who is who is a, a minion of Putin, has said that Slovakia would not ratify documents on Ukraine's admission uh, to NATO. Uh, so they do not support Ukraine going towards NATO. Slovakia's interest will be jeopardised if Ukraine becomes a NATO member, fits so emphasised. And I wonder what NATO does about this. Do they go, well, screw you then, you can do one out of NATO. Or do they try and convince them? Is it too risky to kick people out of NATO? Can you kick people? I mean, you know, I don't know what uh, what the realistic options are and how they uh, come about. But... This is not cool when you have division within a an alliance that's supposed to be all about unity against a common foe. When you have insiders in your, um, or maybe outsiders in your in-group there. Prime Minister added that his country is, quote, quite satisfied with a neutral Ukraine. And its integration with NATO, quote, would only be in favour of World War Three. So that's his position. Then we go to Croatia nearby. 
and support for Ukraine is at stake in Croatia. I didn't realise there are parliamentary elections at the moment. So polls suggest Croatian Democrat un Democratic Union could lose majority to the Social Democrat-led coalition headed by a populist president. So what has happened here, as I understand it, is actually there's a centre-right government, the Croatian Democratic Union, that has broadly been, there's a bit of a status quo, they've broadly been in support of Ukraine, and they were going to comfortably, sort of comfortably win the election. And then the president, a populist president, has given up, I think, his presidency to run for in a parliamentary election. And it's looking like, even though it's a kind of, I think, it's, is it socialist left um, party, with, which generally in Europe, it's it's the far right that's supporting you, uh, supporting Russia. There are instances where that's not wholly the case. Um, and this is one of those which is a little bit funky. But I think the important point is he's one of these populist leaders. So it's the same with Robert Fitzo in Slovakia, that even though he's in a coalition with the extreme far right party there and another party and his party is supposedly centre left. When you look at his policies, they don't really seem to be that. And he's a populist leader. And it's all about this. These these populist leaders that, that are, you know, trying to whip up a storm from the bottom up. Um Anyway, uh, this this is not looking good. So there were these corruption scandals with the existing pro-European uh, prime minister uh, who's been there since 2016. And he was thought to be a bit of a shoe in But now it's all changed with this Mil uh, Milanovic who's now running. Um, so what is let's have a look at this. Uh, but opposition to what many critics see as a pattern of corruption and nepotism has grown uh, with Plenkovich's recent appointment to state attorney general of a high-ranking HDZ affiliated judge. In other words, we've got the existing government doing a bit of like putting their own judges in place. We've seen that elsewhere, haven't we? We've seen that in Hungary. Uh, I know some people will argue we've seen that in, in Poland uh, as well, although that's, that's a bit of a hot mess there. Um, that has sparked protests in Croatia um and yeah it's it's uh, let's have a look here so polls suggest that hdz is likely to lose six of its mp so that's the existing government f for a total of 60 in 151 seat parliament so there's going to have to be a coalition there that would not be enough to uh, to hold its slim majority with minority ethnic and diaspora mps who are guaranteed a role in the government under croatian law the sdb is projected to win about 44 seats three more than in 2020 so it's quite close there with a the right-wing anti-immigration homeland movement on track to come third with 14 and the ecological mazemo party on nine making the right and the greens kingmakers interesting uh so we'll have to see which way that goes uh, Milanovic is more on the Russian side and it's looking like that party is growing in um, in popularity. Uh, so we're keeping an eye on that one. Right, we're going to go to the US now and it's all about Mike Johnson in the US. And it, it's honestly, if it wasn't, if there wasn't so much at stake now, right, if there wasn't a war going on where people are dying, this would just be like fascinating in terms of like, all these different moves and what people are doing, these power plays. It's really, I don't know, Machiavellian, really sort of, I don't know, almost Shakespearean in, in what's going on here. Uh, we're going to pop into Pod Save America, who are avowedly democratic, but like they are, they just give their initial, I mean, this was recorded Monday, but their initial response to um, Mike Johnson splitting the bill into four. As we were as we were talking, our friends at Punchbowl and other Hill reporters mm -hmm. are uh, reporting out of the uh, GOP conference meeting. This is Mike Johnson's meeting with his uh, with his caucus. Apparently, first of all, uh, MTG said that the Trump standing by uh, uh, Johnson doesn't change her. Uh, her mm -hmm. plan to oust mm -hmm. him if he screws her. Where the logic didn't. Just to give you a. a not all of you may, may be as au fait with American politics as Americans are. So uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene is that firebrand populist Republican um, congresswoman who is a representative who is very much in the Trumpian mold. Mike Johnson went to Mar-a-Lago to meet Trump because he's going to be possibly vacated, had his seat vacated by Marjorie Taylor Greene, even though they're all in that like MAGA movement. There's this infighting within the MAGA movement. And 
Trump seemed to sit with Mike Johnson in support him and say, look, I'm not a fan of this move to vacate. And Marjorie Taylor Greene has said, I don't really care. I haven't changed my opinion. Didn't work with her. Yeah. Uh, but they, they apparently, uh, Jake Sherman says, House Republicans plan to try to pass four bills this week to send aid to Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan, according to four sources familiar with the plan. The fourth bill will include a ban on TikTok, a bill to sell uh, seized Russian assets, a Lend-Lease Act for military aid, convertible loans for humanitarian relief, and other provisions. And the GOP leadership will try to move this plan under one rule. Okay. Uh, <laughs> That doesn't sound simpler. <laughs> it does not sound simpler. <laughs> and that, that reaction, that initial reaction is so important. It would have been simpler to just put the Senate bill that's been passed 7029, put that through, vote on that, let's go for it. We don't have to you know, vote on different sets of rules, although they're, they're trying to get them through on one set of rules, uh, and all this kind of carry on. It's just that would expedite what has already been agreed in the Senate, and you won't have to then pass all of these four. We'll have to go back to the Senate, and then they're going to amend them in the Senate. Or maybe amend them at the representatives. You amend them both ways. And then how long till Ukraine gets its aid, if it gets it at all? And uh, and then uh, Hakeem Jeffries said, uh, we're not going to come Democrat. to any conclusion on process until we understand the substance, which seems well, right. Seems like we're recording this say. Monday afternoon, <laughs> so like, you know. Seems like that should always be the case, really. <laughs> yeah, one would hope, right? Uh, so yeah, I mean, it does seem like the Senate bill is the easiest path here, but there, it, it seems like the, he's got, he doesn't know what he's doing. It seems like Mike Johnson doesn't know how he gets out of this. Like what you're saying. He doesn't know how to get out of it. And he's looking for some new, there's, a, there's always been like this search for some way to like cut the Gordian knot. And it's just like, it isn't there. You're just going to untie it and lose your job. Yeah. You have one vote, pal. Yeah. P apparently he also said in the meeting, Johnson said, uh, Ukraine needs to stand on its own. So. Uh, they're just about to take the mickey out of that because if he said that, and apparently that's what he said, that is terrible. Imagine looking over the street and seeing an old lady getting beaten up. As I always say, you use this kind of old lady getting mugged and say, gosh, she's getting the right crap kicked out of her. She's going to need to stand on her own two feet there. You need to stand on your own two feet there. Come on, fight harder. I mean, I could help her. I'm not going to, but I could help. I mean, that'd be the right moral thing to do, right? But uh, I think she needs to stand on her own two... Oh. Oh, she's dead. Oh, she can't stand on her own two feet. Uh, okay. What does that mean, though? I... That we're invaded. <laughs> People are getting killed daily. It's like, it's like okay. oh, we, if, we keep, if we keep giving Ukraine aid, it'll never learn the self-sufficiency and go out there and get a job. <laughs> right. It's time for Ukraine to fly out of the nest. Ridiculous. Unbelievable. Uh, all right. Before we go to break, a uh, few questions. So there is that. Now, it's then, I think, really important to understand some of the machinations going on within, well, really within the kind of MAGA movement in the House of Representatives. Here we've got, and I know this is from MSNBC, and some of you might go, oh, why, you, you know, they're so far left or whatever. Um, they're pretty much centrist in the UK terms. But the woman that she's about to speak is a Republican writer. I think has been a writer for two Republican lawmakers previously. So this is coming from a Republican talking about Marjorie Taylor Greene. And what she says is so important. So people dismiss, I, I keep, I've said this over last week, and I've given you examples from a, a Democrat lawmaker that said uh, she has immense power. Uh, people don't realize it, but, you know, they, they will open a door for her for 10 minutes, quarter of an hour, whatever it was, it, it, when they were voting, even though they should close the doors and you, if you're not there, you don't get to vote. But they, they delayed it so that she could get there. And that's not afforded to any other lawmaker. So what's going on? She gets to wear what she like, uh, you know, the hatch um, hatch law and everything that she gets to. Uh, to to break, she is afforded an awful lot of power and is very powerful at the moment. And this is what this lady says. Yeah, here, this woman here's says the reality that Mike Johnson faces. If he wants to have a functional house, he is going to have to make deals with the Democrats and reality-based Republicans. Because should he choose to try to get Marjorie Taylor Greene's approval for every bill, that is an impossible task. And she threatens him every time he makes a move that she doesn't like. And so, I mean, he doesn't want to admit this, but that is, that is the reality that he is trapped in. And until he decides to actually make a power move and say, this is the way I'm going to run this house and have an assertive role, which I don't expect him to take because no Republican leader has been able to do this thus far. 
he will be subject to the demands of Marjorie Taylor Greene for the rest of his tenure um, as long as she sees fit. But he just went to Mar-a-Lago last week to hug it out with Donald Trump. Didn't that bring him into the good graces of Marjorie Taylor Greene? How did things worsen this week? He was just you know in, in Mar-a-Lago like five days ago. Yeah, but you have to look at the sort of power role that she is playing here. We don't want to admit this because, like Donald Trump, she's kind of this circus-like figure. But look at what she's doing. She's making the Speaker of the House respond to her directly, saying, I will not resign. She is so you've got to understand what's going on here. Like, she, is, you can laugh at her, you can call her a clown, but she is functionally incredibly powerful. She is making Mike Johnson come out and make speeches, and we'll, we'll come to the speech that she's talking about in a little while impeachment manager walking over articles of impeachment to the Senate for, you know, the Americans. And she has a leading role in this house. And it's like, no one wants to admit this fact because it's so embarrassing. But that Such is a good point. Here Such a good point. This goes on. Hey, everyone. MSN People don't want to admit it because it's embarrassing. But it doesn't mean it's not happening. And she is stamping her authority on not just the House, not just the MAGA core of the GOP, not just the GOP at large, not just the House of Representatives at large, but on freaking American foreign policy. Like, I would suggest the reason why Ukraine does not have aid at the moment is because of Marjorie Taylor Greene. Yes, because of Mike Johnson, and yes, because of Trump, but I actually think it's Marjorie Taylor Greene that is that that kind of the third part of that triumvirate there that has the most power over what Mike Johnson has or hasn't done for the last seven months. She is insanely powerful, insanely dangerous and not very clever. That is worrying. Um, okay, Mike Johnson's tactic in Ukraine is exactly what everyone thought. Milia means to further block aid for Putin. Again, I'm going to come to his aid not to his aid, to, I, I will, I think all other things being normal, Mike Johnson would have given aid to Ukraine. I think he just puts his own job and other things on a higher priority such that he does whatever Trump or Marjorie Taylor Greene wants. And at the moment, he's kind of caught between two uh, and is not doing what he kind of in the, in the depths of his mind, he knows is right, I think. And the reason why he split it is to appease those people. So anyway, he split the, the, the bill into four. Top House Armed Services Democrat says Johnson's convoluted Ukraine aid bill will only bring further delays. Definitely, 100%. To the point where the House Intelligence Committee has says it's got a classified briefing on the situation in Ukraine today. So yesterday it got classified information and said, we need to act now. In other words, shit's going to hit the fan. Ukraine are in serious trouble and you guys are pissing about. What is going on? Sorry, sorry to swear, but like I, I'm angry. Um, and this comes as members are still waiting for the bill text for Johnson's four-pronged foreign aid package. And he comes out with, uh, not he, sorry, this is Chairman Turner, um, James Turner, I think it is, and oh, Mike Turner, sorry, uh, Mike Turner and ranking member Jim Himes. So this is a Republican and a Democrat together saying, we must pass Ukraine aid now. Today, in a classified briefing, our committee was informed of the critical need to provide Ukraine military aid this week. The United States must stand against Putin's war of aggression now, as Ukraine's situation on the ground is critical. Uh, completely and utterly agree. I would, however, say, if you feel that strongly, go and sign the discharge petition. All it needs is 23 Republicans, I think, to sign that discharge petition, and you will get the Senate aid passed pretty quickly. Uh, now, what's interesting is when we look at the stats behind what Republican voters think, and I know some of you out there, Republican voters, who get frustrated with me slagging off the Republican Party, but I don't, the MAGA arm of the Republican Party, because you're like, hey, there are like reasonable ones of us out here and we ain't them. But however, those guys are holding the party to ransom and are holding the US government to ransom, but they are not reflective of the voter. So hilariously, says Matthew Foldy here, as a handful of Republicans are trying to out Speaker Johnson over Ukraine funding, AAN has released polling showing that amongst uh, that amongst even solidly Republican primary voters, 
aid to Ukraine is incredibly popular. So um, Russia had no cause and was wrong to invade Ukraine. Strongly agree, 64%, and then another 50, 15% in, in the somewhat uh, agree. So you've got a huge uh, majority there. Um, we have Russia under Vladimir Putin's rule is an enemy of the US. Huge majority. Uh, Vladimir Putin wants to re-establish the Soviet Union's sphere of influence in Eastern and Central Europe. It's quite an involved uh, uh, question or statement there, and you have to do a bit of think about it. So the percentages are left, and you're going to have a lot more uh, don't know. I fully understand that. The US should help Ukraine in its ongoing war with Russia. There you still have a, a majority of 57%, 4% don't know. That's still a fairly useful majority, uh, given that... And, and what's interesting there is like, yeah, you're going to... You evidently have a bunch of people who, who say, right, Russia are the bad guys, Putin's the bad guys, but we shouldn't be helping. So at least they recognise who the good guys and bad guys are. It's just like looking across the street and saying, oh, yeah, she's getting mugged, but oh, I've got to get to the dentist, so... Uh, and I might get hit, I might get injured, so I'm. we don't need to help, but that is bad that the mugger's attacking her, which is a step towards then doing something about it. So it's easier to move, shift those people to to the, yeah, okay, we should we should aid Ukraine, rather than shift people who, who seem to be anti-Ukraine. Uh, the US has an obligation to defend other democracies from invasion. So that's a more abstract idea, uh, and that's kind of going along with the US should be um, we, they should be obliged to be, I guess, world policemen, moral policemen to some degree. 55% still in agreement with that. Obviously, you can cut, uh, slice and dice these strongly and somewhat agree with that. Uh, aid package elements, providing additional funding and protection for US troops stationed overseas. Huge majority for that. Rebuilding US defence industrial capacity to produce military products we need more quickly and efficiently. So in other words, military industrial complex, sorting that out at home, investing in that. Huge uh, hugely popular amongst the voters there. Refilling US weapons stockpiles that may have been drained because many weapons have been sent to Ukraine. Yes, uh, slightly less than before, but still, uh, it's all about helping out the US uh, long term. And then we have tightening sanctions on Putin and others who enable his regime. So broadly, really popular that, 75%. Uh, with 5% don't know. So you've got only 18% against that. Sees why 18% of people wouldn't want to tighten the sanctions on Putin is beyond me anyway. Seizing Russian assets worth up to $300 billion that are currently held up in European banks to help pay for aid to Ukraine, 63%, uh, but still 24% don't want to do that. Like, that's even more people don't want to do that than uh, sanctions. So weird. Uh, but anyway, still a majority of Republican votes, primary voters, up for that. Ensuring any additional aid given to Ukraine is in the form of a loan. And actually, we're going back to 59% here, but that's still you know, a, a majority of Republican primary voters and 10% not knowing there. Uh, I, I think that's that's really good news, though, though those statistics are good news. And it just becomes all the more frustrating that a whole bunch of lawmakers are not representative, it appears, or have unrepresentative power. They appear to be the ones, it's like Adam Kinzinger said, that when you've got a hand grenade that's in a room, uh, you've all got the same amount of power, right? Uh like all of you could or could not do something, you, you, there's equal power there. But when someone goes over, picks up the hand grenade and then is just sort of half taking a pin out, they've got a lot more power than everyone else. And that's what these um, people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, J.D. Vance, uh, and all of these other appeasers of Putin are, are doing at the moment. They're, they're grappling with that hand grenade and they're like, yeah, now we're in control, baby. And it's not good. It's not good for democracy, I don't think. Um it should all be about representation and there's clearly you know not there's something going wrong between the electorate and the people forcing things to happen in congress 
Bill Crystal, uh, a conservative who's anti-Trumper, says, idea from a friend who worked on the Hill, some serious Democrats should join some serious Republicans in a joint statement that they are not going to stand by and let the US be humiliated and hamstrung while our enemies are on the march and thus will oppose any motion to vacate. And this is very interesting. And I I'm going to play you most of this video and talk about it because this is what a lot of people are saying, which is what's going to go on. Is, is Mike Johnson for the high jump? Um, can Mar Marjorie Taylor Green get this done? You've now had a second person come out and said that they are willing to vacate, move to vacate Mike Johnson. House Speaker Mike Johnson is fighting to keep his job. The job he's had for less than six months. At least two House Republicans are threatening to oust him over his plans to handle Ukraine aid, aid to Israel. This was his message just a short while ago. Oops, I don't know what's happening there. One of my Georgian tads is going off on one there. I am not resigning, and it is, um, it is, in my view, an absurd notion that someone would bring a vacate motion when we are simply here trying to do our jobs. Um, it is not helpful to the cause. It is not helpful to the country. It has not helped the House Republicans advance our agenda, which is in the best interest of the American people here. So it's self-evidently true that Marjorie Taylor Greene holds a lot of power because he's out there having to defend his position, his job, in light of what she and others are saying and doing. CNN's Manu Raju is on Capitol Hill. You've been talking to lawmakers all morning. Obviously, Manu, this is about, in the short term, uh, the politics for Mike Johnson. But we shouldn't lose sight, of course, of the fact that Ukraine and Ukraine's allies, both here and abroad, have been begging Mike Johnson to do something quickly so that they don't lose to Russia. Yeah, this has been going on for months and months and months. And just about two months ago is when the Senate passed its own foreign aid package that Mike Johnson sidelined as he tried to come up with his own strategies. He tried to win over Republicans. And just yesterday, he announced that strategy, saying that he's going to move forward on separate bills for Ukraine, for Israel, for Taiwan, and another bill that includes other policy measures, including a ban, uh, could, something that could eventually lead to a ban on TikTok. But here's the catch. It is expected that the House will use a parliamentary maneuver to actually put all those bills in together in one package and send that over to the Senate. And that is what's causing a lot of angst within the GOP ranks. A lot of Republicans, particularly on the hard right, have said there should not be another dime for Ukraine. They do not want to tie this to aid to Israel. Democrats, the White House, want it all tied together because of what they say is an essential, essentially an emergency for Ukraine. They say that this money is needed right now. Now, this all comes, of course, as the threat to, vac to push out Mike Johnson is growing. In fact, Thomas Massey, the, who is a Kentucky Republican, announced behind closed doors that he would support this effort by Marjorie Taylor Greene to push out Mike Johnson from the speakership. And he called on Johnson directly to resign. And I asked him about that interaction in that tense exchange behind closed doors. So you want him to resign? You want him to resign? Yes. Yeah, I asked him to resign. That's what he said. He said he would not. And then I said, well, you're the one who's going to put us into this because the motion is going to get called. I'm not a big fan of this, you know, well, I like the individual votes. I'm not a big fan of putting them all back together. What about the motion to vacate? Would no, you we shouldn't. Be, we don't need that. No way. No way. Which is really interesting. So Jim Jordan and as there's a bad human being ever, if ever there was one, given his past, Jim Jordan. But um it, he is saying that actually we shouldn't move to vacate. And he's one of these sort of Freedom Caucus uh, Republicans that, that could easily have got on board with that. So it just shows the divisions going on. Hey, we, don't, we don't want that. We, we, can't, we shouldn't go through that again. So you're seeing a difference of an opinion there from two conservatives on the right flank of the Republican conference. Of course, Jim Jordan's being one who's influential within a lot of a lot of Republicans. But it's interesting to hear Jordan there. While he opposes this effort to push out Mike Johnson, he also is opposed to what the speaker is trying to do here. You're seeing a lot of divisions among Republicans at this critical time because there's a question here, Dana. Can How long can Johnson survive? And does Mike Johnson even have the votes to get this measure out of the House by the end of the week, which is his goal. So just so many things that are riding on these key decisions at this moment, but a very precarious time for the Speaker. Almost, yeah. almost Speaker Jim Jordan there uh, saying, uh, no, we hmm. should not do this again. The dynamic among Democrats, particularly those who are the most vulnerable, um, there are several of them who are stepping up 
saying, you know what, they would potentially vote to help Mike Johnson because it would help them in their swing districts. What's the dynamic there? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it is an interesting dynamic, much different than what we saw with Kevin McCarthy when all Repu Democrats voted with eight Republicans to oust Kevin McCarthy. This time is different. Several of them, including Tom Swazi of New York, has told me that he will not vote to oust Mike Johnson. Jared Moskowitz said he would not support Marjorie Taylor Greene's efforts to oust him because he, does, he disagrees with Marjorie Taylor Greene on pretty much everything. Whether another member would come forward and push out Mike Johnson, then he said he would evaluate it on that regard. And then there are others who say that if he does move forward on aid to Ukraine, that will be enough for them to save Mike Johnson's speakership. Abigail. So, and this is super important. We need to understand this. The Democrats want to govern, it seems at the moment. Republicans want to govern, but they aren't willing to put their head up to say, we want Ukraine aid. They kind of say it like you have Mike Turner saying it as, in his, as a member of the committee, but all these other lawmakers aren't saying, I want to sign it. I am putting pressure. There doesn't seem to be enough pressure from within the Republican Party. There's pressure. Democrats are saying, we won't vacate him. Some of them, at least, are saying we won't vacate him because we need aid to Ukraine. It's more important than 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 this. Spamberger being one of them. So a different dynamic here, Dana. But will the, how will the numbers add up? Will there be enough de Democrats to save him? What will the Democratic leaders do on that key vote? Those are all key questions that are coming in the days ahead. Dana. Okay, I'm glad you got those comfortable shoes on every single day, Manu. Thank you so much for that great <laughs> reporting. Uh, panel is back here. Thanks. Uh, we must stay with this. Your has a very simple headline. I'll, I'll put it up. Even I didn't write it. Uh, you didn't write it, <laughs> but it's still simple and very apt. We are screwed. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I did write that one. <laughs> um, look, we're st this is going to be incredibly complicated. I think Manu just did a great job breaking it down. And we're really just, this is basic math at this point on whether or not he's going to survive. For every Republican that... Mm -hmm. You know, Johnson loses. He's got to find a Democrat that's willing to come on the side. And that's why, you know, the shoe leather or hopefully comfortable shoes that Manu is wearing are going to be so important because we're just going to be running around and, trying to figure this out. And can we just please take a step back and say, this is not like the most you know, egregious political move that Mike Johnson could make in the grand scheme of things. What he's trying to do is pro provide money for a democracy in Europe under threat, quite literally under siege. And this is why I wanted to let this play out. And sorry to play this, this CNN video for so long, but she's absolutely right. Well, how has this become a partisan issue? And I, I know people say, oh, the MSM aren't talking about Ukraine enough. They are actually, in, in many ways, politically, they're talking about it all the time. These kind of videos and the, the talk about Ukraine with regard to what's going on in Congress are discussed all the time in the news sources I look at. I don't know how much Ukraine is talked about in Fox, probably quite negatively uh, a lot. But what I watch, it, it is. It, they might not be talking about like missile strikes enough, about how terrible things are happening in Chernihiv today, but they are talking about Ukraine funding as, as a, a major source of news every single day, and they have been for a long time because the politicians are talking about it themselves. They are just so frustrated. There's nothing you can do until Mike Johnson does what he does or does or maybe he won't ever do it. And that is as a result of Marjorie Taylor Greene. So we get back to that same old discussion. And this is what he is getting. It's called governing. It's called legislating. It's called carrying out the functions of your office, which uh, to some in his conference uh, is uh, not a positive. But I think one difference here is from the McCarthy thing is just the time in the season we're in. We are during a presidential campaign mm -hmm. season. Uh, there's very uh, little tolerance or less tolerance to sort of uh, motion uh, to vacate and throw the speaker out again. I'm not saying it's not going to happen, right. but when the former president uh, had Speaker Johnson at his side just a few days ago, that was the indication of, mm -hmm. guys, leave him alone, let him do his work. We'll see if they follow. Through. Closer to the presidential election, closer to the day that every House member is on the ballot. Yeah, no, I, I think that'll uh, make some difference. I mean, it is uh, remarkable that the reason that these Republicans are so up in arms about uh, Ukraine funding is because of President Trump and his uh, approach to Putin, his approach and feelings about Russia. So, you know, here we are seeing them do his bidding again, you know, treating him like he's a president uh, in exile in so many ways. And Mike Johnson in a place that I thought 
you know, listen, six months ago, it was imagined that he would be here uh, with his speakership on the line, and likely it'll happen again and again. House Speaker. And, and there you go. I just, I think that's a good synopsis. He, he's on a knife edge. Will he be supported by enough Democrats if it does come to the vote? Or, or will will he will he not get that? And then what will happen then? Because you, if he gets vacated, you can kiss goodbye to Ukraine aid uh, for another long period of time as they muddle through getting another speaker. But then you might get resignations. And I don't know what will happen with regard to whether... The Democrats end up having a majority. Anyway, uh, Olaf Scholz is in China. He's asked Xi Jinping to pressure, uh, put pressure on Russia to end the invasion. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz said on the 16th that he has asked Chinese uh, president to, to put pressure to end that war uh, as China's words carry weight in Russia. True that. Uh, we'll see if there's any success from that visit. Uh, I guess going forward, it might just be uh, on a hiding to nothing. Um, thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe and share. Uh, really appreciate your support. Keep on rocking the free world.